means more to the world's forests than their trees. To journey through them is to discover an intricate web of relationships between the trees and the multitude of animals that live in and among them. There are many forests to be explored between the tropics and the poles. All provide a self-contained living world. To enter the mysterious depths of the forest is to witness an explosion of life in all its diverse forms. But no two forests, from their trees to their animals, are exactly alike. From Madagascar to Siberia, from Alaska to the Amazon, each forest is a showcase of living color and movement, of sheer natural wonder and surprise. Even a single tree there can support a whole world of life. So how many worlds are there in a universe of trees? Sometimes, a forest's silence is its surprise. Here in the Siberian evergreen woodlands, as far north as trees can grow, the trees seem to sleep under white blankets. Their branches are designed not to break under the weight of the heavy snow. This is Siberia at minus 40 and falling. Daylight is brief and weak, as if the power has been shut down for the winter. But of course, the powder. The musk deer is one of the world's smallest deer, so the challenge to keep warm is even greater. They must eat more often than the moose, and lichen is really all that is available, apart from conifer needles that are full of resin and indigestible. A tit fluffs its feathers into a kind of double duvet, and these ordinary-looking dead leaves turn out to be tents for caterpillars sewn together to keep out the cold. The cold, though, is all a dead leaf can keep out, and if a tit spots one with the telltale curl, it rips it like wrapping to get at the soft treat inside. Protein and fat are a rare find in the winter and prime fuel. A black bear uses roughly the same strategy as a caterpillar, it holds up, but a lot more securely. For a bear and her cub, getting through the winter is no struggle at all. A full store of fat built up in the autumn, a den so warm it actually gets hot, and absolutely no activity apart from suckling and being suckled. Another hibernator, the chipmunk, is too small to stay asleep all winter. It wakes up cold every few days and has to raid the kitchen for a snack. Large animals can amass fat in their bodies, but small ones have to store food in more conventional ways. The chipmunk spent the autumn stocking up on pine cones. So now it's a bite to eat, a drink of ice water, and time to hit the sack again. Red-backed voles don't bother hibernating at all. Their winter days under the snow are filled with the constant search for berries, seeds, and lichen. By huddling together, they stay warm in their network of tunnels. And in the winter stillness, voles can be heard under the snow. One of the main listeners is the great gray owl. Its winter survival depends on catching voles. Food is so scarce now that it has to hunt both night and day. So its eyes are smaller than other owls and are accustomed to daylight. On five-foot wings and wrapped in long downy feathers, the great gray is one of the world's largest owls. 
In coniferous forests across Eurasia and North America, it has to brave the severest northern winters. Winter will but the pack that will bring down a moose, ten times the weight of any single wolf. To survive such an icy world, animals have bodies and behavior designed to meet winter's challenge in these largest of all forests. For 10,000 miles, from Scandinavia across Eurasia to North America, the great northern spruce forest is an evergreen belt encircling the globe, in places 1,200 miles wide. In North America, grizzly bears emerging between April and June are a sure sign that the bitter cold is gone. This one-year-old and its brother were suckled all winter in their den, and now, like their mother, they are very hungry. The den was dark and cramped. Now there's a whole new world for the cubs to explore. Their year has begun, but in these high latitudes, the warmth and extended daylight are brief luxuries. Spring is more leisurely further south and comes earlier to the broad-leaved woodlands of New England. In this milder climate, aspens and oaks unfurl new leaves. The transition from northern coniferous forest to deciduous woodland is subtle, and many animals live successfully in both. Leaves are raw material for caterpillars, and caterpillars are food for blue jays, a simple food chain. This family hatched at the time of greatest insect abundance. Nothing exists in isolation in the forest. Other birds exploit other insects. A woodpecker can hear hidden insects moving and can tell where tunnels have been bored. Its bill is a powerful chisel and its long tongue inescapable. These holes are made by a woodpecker that skips the insect link and feeds from the tree itself. The sapsucker harvests each pool of sugary resin and accepts as a bonus any insect stuck in the sap. A surprise! A hummingbird, newly arrived from the tropics, finds each well of sap as attractive as any flower filled with nectar. Even ducks hear wood ducks nest in trees. And why not? What's safe for other birds' eggs is safe for ducks' eggs. Ducklings, though, aren't like other baby birds. High-rise growing up is fine if you don't have to go anywhere else. But ducklings do, to water. And trees don't have elevators. And mother's calling. So they go to the ledge and leap. For something so light, a pile of leaves is as good as a fireman's net. The raccoon is far less choosy. It'll eat almost anything, and so it flourishes in towns as well as forests. In its grasping hands, the crayfish stands little chance. And a raccoon soon recognizes competition. Or maybe danger. 
The successful animals in these northern American forests must cope with the stresses of the changing seasons. But travel to where the sunlight never weakens, water never freezes, and the air is forever warm. And there, in the lands beside the equator, are the humid, sun-drenched rainforests of the world. During 60 million years of uninterrupted growth, life has exploited every level within these forests. Between the canopy and the forest floor lives the greatest show of animals and plants on Earth, a cast of millions, representing half of all known species alive today. Hawk eagles, 150 feet above the Amazon forest floor, may share their tall tree with 10,000 insects. On their hunting ground, the sun-soaked canopy of the forest are tens of thousands more. When a single tree in this forest blossoms, its flower clusters attract a multitude of monkeys and birds. A capuchin, above that some squirrel monkeys. Not far away, two kinds of tamarind are dining. To these animals, the trees are the earth's surface. They almost never touch the actual ground. Around them are birds, honey creepers and tanagers, parrots, macaws, hummingbirds, and toucans. There may be a million still unnamed plants and animals sharing this world, each suited to its own level in this multi-layered rainforest. In the dimmer light of the rainforest floor, army ants march across the debris that falls from above, dismembering any unfortunate creature that strays into their path. Their booty will be carried back to their underground headquarters. Their sortie has brought them a hundred yards or so away from the temporary nest, and though blind, they are tracking a scent trail laid by scouts at the head of the column. Now it leads them back. In this underworld of dismemberment and decay, the forest feeds on itself, recycling the substances of life back into the trees. It looks impossible, but in Borneo, paradise tree snakes climb tree trunks as though they're on level ground. And what one snake can do on a branch, another can do without a tree at all. This one flattens into a ribbon that catches the air and actually crawls through it, coiling to control its glide path. And in a place where snakes can fly, so can squirrels. How much easier to glide from meal to meal rather than trekking to the ground and back. By evolving a sail held taut by arms and legs, they blaze new trails through the trees. Clear binocular vision and strong grasping hands allow primates to move rapidly between trees. The lemurs, which evolved before the monkeys, were among the first to try it. And in Madagascar's forests, Veros Shifaka is one of the finest leapers. The award for acrobatics goes to the gibbons of Southeast Asia. Leaping 30 feet at a time, gibbons are the trapeze kings of the canopy. Across the great forests of the tropics, the lives of animals and plants are so tightly woven that it's almost impossible to unravel them. Perhaps the basic relationship is between the animal feeder and its plant food. But even obvious examples of that can be deceptive. 
We call these Amazonian ants leaf cutters because that's exactly what they do. They cut up leaves and take them back to their nest. And they're prodigiously good at it. They can strip huge trees at a rate of one a day. But what do they do with the leaves when they get home? The leaves are mainly cellulose and ants can't digest that. What they are doing is much more complicated. They're actually organic gardeners. They're mulching the leaves into a compost and using the compost to grow a digestible fungus. The nest is 20 feet in diameter and 18 feet deep. And in a thousand chambers like these, enough fungus is cultivated to feed all the workers and all the grubs. What's more, these ants have so refined the fungus to their needs that it grows nowhere but in leaf cutter colonies. They've bred it, domesticated it. To a pygmy marmoset, a walking leaf may be a curiosity, but its real interest in the tree goes deeper, about as deep as it can dig with its chisel-like teeth. At the end of the hole is nutritious sap. But the animal-plant relationship isn't all one way. Animals aren't just predators. It takes a lot of plant energy to generate nectar-rich flowers, and a butterfly that feeds on the plant is also being contracted to carry its pollen. But butterflies need to beware of imposters. Here is a sumptuous orchid offering the usual food in payment for a pollen transfer. The butterfly lands, begins the search for the nectar tap, and too late, discovers that this is an animal in plant clothing, an orchid mantis. No wonder these birds have to feed every 10 or 15 minutes, and in the course of a day, visit about 2,000 flowers. Theirs is a marriage made in jungle heaven. Guaranteed pollination in return for nectar few other birds can hope to reach. These New Guinea blossom bats fly only at night, and so that's when this flower opens. The bat gets a drink of nectar and a dusting of pollen. The bat will smear this on the next flower it visits and come away with another face full of pollen. In the jungle supermarket, all kinds of fruits tempt all kinds of customers. Bright colors attract high flyers that need energy-rich sugars. Even very small fruits can be plucked by the South American toucan. It's a trick that an unrelated bird in Indonesia has mastered as well. The greater Celebes hornbill can even pluck fruit on the wing. It's a clever compromise for a bird too big to hover. Birds eat not only fruit, but nuts, which the beaks on these scarlet macaws are built to crush. For the birds, that's fine. Nuts are nutritious. But for the plants, it's not. Nuts are their seeds, and the birds are supposed to be passing them through, not cracking them. So some plants add poison, and when the macaws get the resulting stomach ache, they go to the forest pharmacy. There's kaolin in this clay, and they use their beaks to prepare it. Functioning as a natural mortar and pestle, beak and tongue crush the kaolin to a powder, a medicine that contains essential calcium and sodium salts, enough to settle any macaw's indigestion and to send the bird back to forest feasting. night, 
fruits that festoon the forest are invisible to most fruit eaters. For a night monkey, this is a golden opportunity. Because most birds and other monkeys are sleeping, there's no competition. With eyes that can see in the dark, it's the only monkey that works a night shift. But darkness the world over has many other eyes. In Vietnam, a clouded leopard stalks jungle fowl, the ancestral chickens. They seek refuge in the trees. And he knows it. A chicken dinner for the smallest and rarest of leopards. Slivers of moonlight can sometimes reveal predators at work, but nocturnal forest animals usually try to stay in the darkest shadows. The tarsier is like monkeys and humans, a primate, and it has the primate ability to judge distance and grasp with its hands. In the dark, many signals flash. Nocturnal courtships often begin with illuminated introductions. In Africa, an excited male epauletted bat seeks like-minded females with a view to mating. His shoulder patches catch her eye. His ringing cries set her fluttering around him. Success could be his in this forest full of love calls. vocal sacks of frogs broadcast each owner's self-advertisement. He who shouts loudest may well be the sexiest, but he runs the risk of losing his life before his virginity. A fringe-lipped bat has a good ear for locating frogs that are a-wooing. But not every audible frog is good eating. Some are poisonous, and the bat's keen hearing can distinguish an edible call from a deadly one. Broadcaster and listener prey and predator. Sounds and signals in the world of animals have precise meanings. Sound is essential in the dense jungle by night and also by day. In the still dawn air, sound travels far. The Madagascan forest echoes to the voices of the Indries. The females take the lead in proclaiming ownership of their territory and the food that's there. In the tropical forests of Australia, a bird whose mating success depends dramatically on sight and sound is preparing a court a piece of his territory where he'll entertain any female that may wander through. They will compare the splendor of his plumage and his prowess at mimicking bird songs with other males of his kind. He is a liar bird.
Is she impressed? Or not? Who can know, in all that splendor, exactly what subtleties the female sees? All we can say is that countless generations of female lyrebirds choosing to mate with certain males have created this spectacle. And female rifle birds have created this. Rifle bird is one of the birds of paradise, all of them singing, dancing works of art, sculpted entirely by feminine selection. of course, appear immensely proud of what they are. A Wallace's standard wing, flexing his gorgeousness. Yellow and white birds of paradise in a communal show, a chorus line. The best performer might end up mating with 90% of the discriminating females. female saves her energy from motherhood. Her choice now will determine whether it's all worthwhile. Thirty-eight birds of paradise can coexist on this island of New Guinea, where there are no competitors and few predators. Forests on islands have special qualities. No monkeys or apes ever reached here, but kangaroos did, so there are tree kangaroos. In spite of the difficulties, seven kinds of tree kangaroo managed to live up here and suckle babies in their pouches. For millions of years, the sea barrier kept many predators and competitors for food off the island. So strange and unusual animals flourished on the ground, while kangaroos took to the trees. A cassowary can look a person straight in the eye. It's six feet tall and the largest animal to walk these forests. To walk, since it also weighs a hundred pounds, flying is out of the question. But so what? Nothing in New Guinea is big enough to attack a cassowary. So it might as well take the easy way and walk. Tree living kangaroos, walking birds, and flying foxes. Millions of years ago, fruit bats flew here from Asia, settled down, and evolved. The result? More species of these animals than are found anywhere else in the world. Spectacled flying foxes are one of about 60 species of these large flying mammals. By day, they fold their three-foot-wide wings and hang around in colonies of thousands. They squabble over roosting space and fan themselves to cool their bodies which have thick fur to protect them from the cool night air. These are among the largest fruit bats and are called foxes only because that's what they look like. There's even been scientific speculation lately that they might be a kind of primate. To find their favorite fruits, they can fly more than 25 miles a night. 
and the resulting scattering of seeds makes them the most important tree planters in the forest. Rain is the lifeblood of all tropical forests. Wet and dry are the only seasons. Umbrella-winged fruit bats in New Guinea are tailored to this routine of daily deluge. In South America, a titi monkey shelters under the leaves. But few animals are really bothered about getting wet. Water rolls off plumage and fur, and clinging to branches is wise. The ground below will soon be saturated and awash. Birds of prey are grounded, and fishing is suspended, even for the cormorant. Between December and May, six feet of rain bursts the banks of the Amazon's tributaries. Vast areas of lowland go under. 30 feet deep in water, this is known as the flooded forest. For seven months each year, forest and river become indistinguishable. And these upstream reaches of the Amazon basin attract animals usually associated with the ocean. These are boto dolphins, freshwater mammals that come here with the floods to hunt fish in the flooded forest. Like ocean-going dolphins, they use sonar, bouncing sound, to find the fish. But they can do something ocean dolphins can't, bend their necks. In cluttered waters too murky to see in, this increases the sonar's range and flexibility. They create wide waves of ultrasound, listen for the fish-shaped echoes, and pounce. With its long beak and pointed teeth, a young dolphin tries to tear off a piece for itself. The youngster was born in the low water season, when fish and botos were confined to the main river channels. It'll stay with its mother for about a year, learning how to navigate and hunt. In this submerged Amazonian world, dolphins hunt where at other times of the year birds do. Freshwater stingrays now fly over ground where squirrels and ring-tailed coatis once foraged for seeds and fruits. If a rainforest is usually full of surprises, a flooded one is almost surreal. A three-toed sloth is changing feeding trees. Sloths go through the water as they go through the trees, with a strong, slow, steady pace. It takes hours, but they can cross the Amazon itself. They feed on leaves, high in the canopy. Usually, they only come down once a week to defecate. But if the only way to get between trees is to swim, then they swim. A sloth is perhaps the only mammal with green fur. That's because there's algae in it. It's a partnership. The sloth absorbs nutrients from the algae through its skin. One third of a sloth's weight may consist of leaves, which are being slowly processed by cellulose digesting bacteria in its stomach. The foliage is good cover from the searching eyes of eagles. Sloths can hide among their food unlike some. Few faces could be more surprising than the bald wakaris. This white-haired kind lives only in a small region of the Amazon forest. As many as 50 may travel together. A mature male's facial hair recedes and his color deepens. But the reason for such vivid baldness is not yet clear. He's not really as angry as he looks, just calmly seeking fruits to open for the seeds, 
and flowers for the nectar. Wakaris are great leapers, as much as 90 feet at a bound, a useful talent when the forest floor has turned into a lake. Much of the tree and plant life of this flooded forest is unique and has evolved to survive long periods of inundation by the Amazon. But where rivers in the tropics meander to the sea, a different kind of flooded forest grows, with its feet washed by salt water tides twice a day. These coastal conditions favor special trees, the mangroves. They stand on stilts, high branching roots that gather mud, trapping river sediment, building land for their seedlings. In Borneo, proboscis monkeys are at home among the mangroves. Wading is risky at high tide. There are crocodiles. But to eat well, risks have to be taken. It's possible his nose is like that because it impresses females. Hers is certainly less pronounced. Like South American sloths, proboscis monkeys have stomachs designed to digest leaves, but they must be careful to choose the right age of leaf. Older ones contain poisons. So their pot bellies are as natural as their big noses. Looking like a patriarch with a beer belly, one male dominates a family group. At the end of the day, they move into higher trees, seeming to prefer the outer limbs, unafraid of falling. And here they'll wedge their bodies among the branches and sleep a hundred feet above the river and the mangroves on which they depend. The dry eucalyptus forest of Australia and another specialized feeder there are many remarkable animals here, none more so than the koala. Almost the only food koalas eat and, amazingly, digest is the eucalyptus's tough, fibrous, toxin-filled leaf. Fortunately, they can find this food all year. The trees never shed all their leaves at the same time and theirs is not exactly an energy-packed, active lifestyle. A mother koala gives birth once a year. Like a kangaroo, the inch-long newborn climbs instinctively towards her pouch. There it feeds and grows for six months. And the day will come when the young koala will leave the pouch and cling to its mother's back for a full year. As long as there are eucalyptus forests to feed in, life is fine for koalas. But any animal that's come to rely on only one plant or tree for its survival is greatly at risk if those plants cease to exist. Two tiny fragments of its original range have been turned into farmland. Giant pandas are among the rarest and most endangered of animals. Bamboo, a giant grass. So dependent have pandas become on bamboo, and so hard is it for them to digest that an adult must eat about 30 pounds every day or it begins to starve. But at times, bamboos become scarce. Every 40 to 60 years, all the bamboos on a mountain live the mountain gorillas, the rarest and the biggest of the apes. A large silverback male has brought his family group to today's picnic place. Food, mainly leaves, is plentiful here. Few fruits grow at this height, but there's always a meal within easy reach. 
the mountain gorillas live comfortably in a gigantic salad bowl. His mother can eat 60 pounds of greens a day. Only in such a safe, isolated, lush and stable forest could these gorillas have evolved at all. Childhood is long, and his mother is as caring as any human parent. Any animal with a large brain needs time for education, and the close bonds between infant, family and parent are essential if the youngster is to learn to survive in this mountain forest. The only threat to their pleasant lives is the human turbulence in this region of Central Africa. At play, youngsters learn the limitations of their strength and weight. They test each other's patience, seeing just how far they can go. And like the adult females, the silverback male enjoys a romp with the young. join in more boisterous games. This apparent fight is only play. Males use their size to intimidate, and they can grow very big, well over human height and weighing 600 pounds or more. Love a chase. Left to themselves, they are gentle, caring. two other kinds of gorilla in Africa. But these mountain gorillas have been isolated from them for perhaps a million years. Their diet has changed, their coats have thickened, and their habits and routines are different. They are what they are because of the forest they live in. If that ever disappears, and it could, there will never be mountain gorillas again. Some forests, though, that disappear regularly. North American pine forests can get very dry after a long summer, and a single lightning bolt can turn them into raging infernos. Thousands of acres burn with frightening speed. But fire here doesn't mean the end of life. Some animals will die, of course, but many instinctively avoid the blaze. A fast-traveling fire doesn't burn deeply into the ground. Still, there are few more terrifying sights than a forest fire. On the scale of our short lifetimes, the destruction seems the newest grasses pushing through the burnt earth are a sweet attraction to deer. Soon the smoke of summer is replaced by the mists of autumn and a different blaze of color sweeps over the trees. The colors show that sap has been cut off from the leaves. The trees are now conserving moisture, 
again slowly shutting down for winter. The days are shorter now. The air is cooler. Alerted by such signals, chipmunks begin their year-end race for survival. Cheek pouches swell with pine seeds and berries. They are like shopping bags ready to be unpacked in the burrows where the chipmunks will hibernate. An acorn woodpecker is also busy hoarding. Into each hole, the bird stuffs an acorn. The pock marks on the oak suggest that winter will be long. But how can the woodpecker be sure his cache is safe? First, find a hole that fits. Then hammer it home. And hammer another even tighter. Fall is blueberry time. And after blue... Some grizzly bears, living within reach of good salmon rivers, use the season's final spawning runs to finish fattening their enormous bodies for the winter. Salmon are... It looks as though he'll be relying on his parents again. Sometimes, an older bear is just too full of fish to worry about a thief. so cold that little but the wind will stir the trees. Summer birds will have migrated south. Only the hardiest of hunters remain. The bears and chipmunks will have gone to ground. And like them, the great diversity of this forest's animal life will still be there. Its pulse slow but strong, ready to beat fast again at the coming of spring. <laughs>